It's time for another round of Hot GPT. Our topic today is how to be a good startup board member. All right, ready to go. Start generating. Now, why did I choose this topic? Well, it was a listener request. Thank you, Jeremy. Love this topic. I've been on a bunch of startup boards over the years. And I got to tell you something. It's really been all over the map in terms of the quality of the way these boards work. Sometimes you have a board that works really well with the CEO, high impact, really makes a difference. Other times, not so much. And so this is a really important topic because especially nowadays, VCs everywhere, you know, there's been so much investment and there are fewer people with experience sitting on boards. And so this is an opportunity. I'm not going to criticize, but I see it as an opportunity for people to learn and step up and do a better job than perhaps they've been doing in the past. Plus the easy days are over, right? <laughs> we had a couple of years where there wasn't a ton of rigor and now the market is tight in companies are struggling to raise money. And so they will need their boards to really step up to the plate and help them to succeed, to challenge them, to dig deep into their networks, all the things that boards can do if the board is functional. So what we're going to do today is talk about, I got, I got a lot today actually, because this is an important topic. We're going to talk about seven, seven important things that one can do to be a helpful, effective, supportive, superstar startup board member. All right, let's start with number one. You got to know the role. So boards are about governance. I actually took this class in business school called Board of Directors, which was pretty awesome. The guy who taught at Jay Lorsch at the time was, he had to be 80 years old. He was this real thinker. Maybe he was a little younger, but he was definitely a man with a lot of experience. So Jay, if you're listening and I've gotten your age wrong, you can write in and yell at me. But anyway, I remember taking this class and one of the things we focused on was the fact that the board of directors is different than the management. Maybe you have the CEO on the board, that does happen, or a co-founder, totally happens. But the job of the board is not to get involved in day-to-day -day management. It's about governance, providing oversight and strategic guidance. And the other thing that's important about boards is they have specific duties that actually, if God forbid you get involved in a legal case, this is where boards get in trouble. Boards have fiduciary responsibilities, things like a duty of care. So they have to actually do the work and you know, just roll in unprepared. Duty of loyalty, you know, you've got to put this company's interests paramount to other sort of potential competing interests or conflicts of interest. And obedience, you got to follow the rules. So those things are really important. And so if you're going to become a board member, you have to study up on those things because there is insurance, of course, if you get sued or something. But if you are breaching these responsibilities, you know, you can end up in a sticky wicket, as the Brits say. You don't want to be there. So you need to know the role. That's number one. Number two, build a strong relationship with the CEO. And I would argue as appropriate other members of the management team. Your job is to support and challenge. That means digging into the numbers, asking smart questions, meeting between board meetings, having regular open communication, a cadence of communication, where you're just trying to make sure you're informed. You know, sometimes these boards meet three, four times a year. They might be monthly. It just depends on the company. But if you are not staying informed, learning and coming prepared, to ask thoughtful questions, then you're not doing your job, right? Because startups change all the time. So you just can't phone it in. It's not like it's JP Morgan, right? And you know, it's like that thing's like a country. No, you gotta be on top of things and come up with an agreement with the CEO for some sort of regular cadence of communication in between board meetings, all right? Number three, strategic guidance. So one of the things that you need to do as a board member is think long-term. Obviously, we'll talk about some short-term stuff too, but it's about setting vision, keeping that CEO on track about setting the direction in which they want to sail. I've seen board meetings get stuck in nitty gritty. Nitty gritty is good because it builds cases around the big ideas, but if you're always in the minutia, you're gonna get lost. You have to step back and figure out the vision. Super important job for boards of directors, startups. All right, I have four more for you. 
We'll hit those right after the break. FOMO. FOMO. All right, Pat GPT, we're talking about how to be a great startup board member. You can do it, I promise. You can do it. Number four, table stakes, but it's still, I've seen, man, I have seen the other side of this one. Be prepared and be engaged. Don't just phone it in. I mean, we have busy lives. Like, have I ever shown up to a board meeting not super prepared? I'm not going to admit it, but did it happen? Maybe. And you know what? That is not okay. You have to have read the materials, go through them. You have to have the questions in advance. Just be prepared to dig in as appropriate and then engage in the discussion in a constructive way. The job of the board meeting isn't just to say, great job, everybody. You know, that's nice, but it's not a great use of time. The job of the board members is to ask smart, probing questions. Yeah, you can tell them you did a good job, of course, when something goes well, but it's more than being a cheerleader. It's being a source of oversight and then leveraging your experience in order to ask questions or probe into things that could be early warning signs of opportunities or problems. So you got to show up ready to go bring your game face, as it were. Number five, this is one that I think a lot of people miss out on. Leverage your network. So early in my career, I worked for a guy called Fred Wilson. I didn't directly report to him. I was reporting to a woman called Susan Siegel, but Fred was at Flatiron Partners. He invested along with Susan and, and my team at Chase Capital Partners in a lot of deals, deals that have gone on to become huge companies. One was called Mercado Libre, which if you Google that, a massive company today. And what I saw with Fred and Susan was that they were really masters of thinking about people and their networks who could add value, advice, connections, potential commercial relationships, fundraising, talent acquisition, you name it. I remember observing this. And that was really, for me, an unlock because I was just out of college. I didn't have a network at the time, but I thought someday, if I know a lot of people, I'm gonna do what they do. It is very important. Now, there is a flip side to that because some people just start naming everybody they've ever met, even if they can't even get them on the phone in a very willy-nilly way. No, be intentional because management teams of startups don't have unlimited time. So be intentional about people you can actually get to that actually are gonna take the call and be helpful and also curate that list and you will be very, very impactful as a board member. Number six, this goes back to network as well, but it's just, you know, this is kind of like fundamental to any startup environment, support the fundraising efforts. And this for me means number one, introductions obviously to potential investors, but it also means helping the company to think through how they're gonna tell their story. What is their strategy? Because, you know, nowadays the easy days of fundraising, those are long gone. Companies that wanna raise money have to have a tight narrative. They have to have a story about where they are going and why they're doing what they're doing. I mean, you have to have that stuff turnkey and you have to figure out who are the investors who will like that, with whom that kind of message will resonate, right? And so there's a lot of strategic thinking and thoughtfulness. And what I like to do actually is just kind of have a separate meeting with the founder or management team or CFO or whoever, and just be like, all right, let's just spitball, brainstorm. Like, who do you know? Who do I know? And usually what happens is we come up with some outside the box thinking or very obvious thinking that we just hadn't gotten to yet. And then they have a CRM, they put it in there and you are good to go. Finally, number seven, this is the one I think actually boards don't do very much. And I think it's a huge opportunity. Continuous improvement, like assess yourself board, step back every you know, year or so and say, what is working? What is not? Who is doing their job? Who is not? Do we need new people on this board? What are the skills we want to add? Who's totally phoning it in and we should ask them to maybe leave, right? I mean, some people have a, a contractually appointed board seat, so they can stick around. But sometimes the independents, they're just not doing their job. So you got to think about that. And so, for example, say you have a company that's been around for five years and now they're getting an AI. Who could you bring on the board that would have insights? So that is important. Renewal, fresh ideas. That's how startups win and grow. All right, everybody. Those are my seven tips to how to make a startup board successful and how to be a great startup board member. It's not rocket science, but it does require 
some thought, some energy, some attention, some humility, right? Because at the end of the day, <laughs> humility, I say, people come in sometimes hot on their own, you know, sort of sense of self. Startups, you don't know where things are going to go. You have a thesis, but you don't know. And so having a little humility and having a learning mindset when you're a board member and not thinking you know all the answers, that also, that's number eight. I didn't make it number eight on my little list, but I'm ending it with that. That's really important too. All right, everybody. We'll see you on Thursday for another episode of FOMO Sapiens. Until then, take care of yourselves and Pat GPT, stop generating. FOMO. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com.